Hi everybody, Todd Dammit Kearns here. Today, brought to you by my fine friends at Gibson Guitars, where this magical non-reverse 2021 Thunderbird in Inverness Green, which you'll be seeing on stage sometime near you. Today, a very good friend of mine, I finally get to talk to somebody after a couple of weeks off. This is a, breaking up this sausage party with Brit Lightning, the amazing guitar player from the rock and roll band, all female, multi platinum selling act, Vixen. Ladies and gentlemen, Brit Lightning. Just in case you were curious. Now it's official. <laughs> All right, awesome. How have you been? I'm so good. It's great to see you here. You too, you too. I'm so excited. We were supposed to do this a long time ago, but it's been uh, a wacky time, a wacky moment. Sure has, it sure has. <laughs> you had to get ready for a gig in less than 24 hours of the full set list. Oh God, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, it was like, it had just come out of nowhere. I don't know if anybody's all that curious of spend up the entire time talking to Brit, talking about my stuff, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to interview you. We're going to change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just shift gears. Actually, that'd be a pleasant surprise on occasion. <laughs> now I'd be like so boring, but largely I was sitting exactly over here going over songs for Took, my Canadian band. We we're going to Canada and I get a text from Zach Throne, my friend that plays in Corey Taylor's band going, Hey dude, bass player got COVID, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh, well, yeah. And I'm like, wait a second. That gig's tomorrow night, right? Oh God! Like, 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 you know, like the next day, and I'm like, oh wow, because it's one thing to sit down and learn, you know, if it's a few days, you're kind of like, okay, cool, or a week, great, but in 24 hours can be a bit of a, okay, and then I said, well, if you've got somebody <laughs> who's more qualified <laughs> or more more ready, you should call that guy. If, you, <laughs> if you're stuck, give me a call. And then between the time, you know, because I'm sitting there and I'm listening to the to the things I'm supposed to be working on. So I just call up some of Corey's stuff and, you know, cause a lot of the stone sour stuff I'm familiar with, though I've never played it. That, that makes a big difference. If you're mildly familiar with stuff. A huge difference. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to completely from scratch. Right. But, but it was enough from scratch in that like I'd had the uh, CMFT record that Corey put out and I'd listened to it a lot. And then like everything else, you got sidetracked and whatever else. And, and then I, okay. So I sat down and went over a few songs and thought, yeah, this is doable. So by the time they came back with that text that said, we're stuck, I was like, okay. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. And you pulled it off. It went amazing. I, well, you weren't there. You have no idea. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> you know, we should all start, I mean, especially touring during this nonsense with the COVID and all that, like REO Speedwagon has shut it down. I, I, there's a long list. Tesla. They shut down uh, everything, REO? Yeah, they went home from far as I know. Yeah. Oh, could we have a gig coming up with them in um, like two weeks? Maybe they just shut it down for a couple, for like. Yeah. Yeah, oh, maybe they can't shows, them. yeah. Up on the yeah if, if you haven't heard anything, then I'm assuming they just went home for mm. till, till whoever was uh whoever was the uh patient got better. So yeah. Right. Um but yeah, it's wacky times. So we should almost all it's funny because I've had a few people just call like preemptively, like, hey, what are you doing? You know, you know, just in case something crazy happens. And I'm kind of like, well, what's your set list look like? And you know, you better send it over. So I'm kind of like that far ahead of it. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. Have you, so I'm sure. They know every band set list right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they'll all bleed together. I'll be on stage going, is it Steven Adler or Corey Taylor? It's the funniest <laughs> thing because in the same position I'm standing, like I did Adler last night, I did Steven Adler on Fremont Street and I'm standing. Oh yeah, in, that looked great. How was that? That was a blast. Yeah. Um, I'm standing in the exact same position with that I do in the Slash band and with Corey's band and all that kind of stuff where you're kind of like, you're doing your thing, your head's down, you look up and go, oh, who are you people? Why are you? Why are you here? <laughs> Where am I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally surreal. Um, but I'm sure you've had all kinds of situations like that too, as far as gigs just popping up. What I have learned is that, and I'm not very good at it because in reality, I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy who blows off another gig just because something else came along. I, good things have come along in my life and I've gone like, yeah, but I'm sort of locked into A, B, and C and that good gig can go away because I'm a nice guy as opposed to like, 
the good gig has showed up. Screw all you people. And then just run well, out. Well, but that's them. good because people respect that. And that's, I mean, that means you're like a loyal guy that they would want to call in the future because you can stick to plans. So that is important. I hope so. I mean, I w- we'll see. Nice guys finish last. That doesn't seem like a negative thing, though, does it? Last means you, keep, <laughs> you go the distance, I guess, is the idea. True, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now where did, uh, the, here's the crazy thing, because whenever I talk to, uh, I've, I've, always been a, a great admirer and a, surrounded by female musicians my whole life because um just the funniest thing is when you play music in a scene it, it felt like at one point in my life that everybody was a musician you know what i mean like almost everybody i knew was a musician and and that meant guys girls whatever and it was sort of like cross-pollinating all over the place where there were you know there were there were all girl bands but there were plenty of bands where guys and girls were playing together in the 90s that really became it's weird to talk about isn't it it's so silly to talk about but in retrospect, it seemed like there were guy bands and things like, you know, the Runaways or something like that was was a complete anomaly. But taking into account things like Heart, you know, and how respected the Wilson sisters were, um, you know, that it still became an anomaly. Well, into like suddenly Prince has a largely, you know, a large percentile of female, uh, very heavy hitters that make the rest of us look like, damn, we can't hang with those people. <laughs> um, but is it, I guess it just sort of, it's an interesting thing to talk about because when you're a young girl, I guess it's more about the surroundings, your family, that kind of stuff. When a guitar becomes interesting to you that they go, of course you should get a guitar. Or is it, you know, was that, was that something that your family was cool with? You know, they were just, my family is not really musical at all. So oh, okay. they, they really are in the dark about all that my dad you know grew up with one hank williams record and my mom just liked disco and so they were just not rock and roll at all and um so i played the flute um all through school and then randomly heard eruption and started hanging out with rocker kids and then was just like oh my god van halen metallica like (laughs) great things and i was like i need a guitar and my dad was actually excited he was like cool. I like that idea. I'll take you guitar shopping. And uh, we went to the guitar store and I'm like, I come around the corner with like a sparkly purple Ibanez and a a practice amp. And he's like, well, okay, that's a guitar, but what is that? And he just expected that I was going to get an acoustic and like strum country songs or something. I'm like, I crank Metallica from my bedroom. Why would I be (laughs) an acoustic? So he was like supportive until he saw the amp, but then, uh, but then he came around anyways. And, and they, my parents were very supportive actually, because my house, my parents' house became the jam house and we had a big house, but like one side of the living room, move the drum set in, move the half stack in. And, uh, and they were cool. We lived in the woods, so neighbors couldn't complain. And um, so we had a good setup. They were very tolerant. <laughs> Where was this? Where did you grow up? Massachusetts, uh, right. a little bit outside of Boston. Yeah. Okay. So that's that, you're like so ahead of the game already because most of us have to, um, you know, we grab an acoustic, nothing that nice. That's a Gibson, but I, I had like a, you know, uh, and we have to learn all the campfire songs. And why am I learning these stupid campfire? I want to learn. You know, Van Halen. Yeah, I want yeah. to learn the rock and roll songs. Because then you always get yeah, that. Actually, I think is is a real testament for kids to get real bored real fast. And sometimes that can just kind of like it goes in the goes in the closet with the karate outfit and whatever else you abandon. <laughs> totally. And I don't know why they start kids on acoustic because it's harder on your fingertips. I mean, I didn't play acoustic for like three years. I was Good always I started electric. Yeah, I didn't Good know how to play acoustic. I had no interest in it. Well, you're ahead of the game too, having parents that were like, yeah, come jam at our house. My parents were like, we, 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 you know, we, whenever you start putting bands together, you take shifts at different people's houses. And I could tell my dad was just like, okay, that's it. Figure yeah. out where you, you know, I'd be like everybody out. But if well, you, you have know, parents, parents that are cool. were very overprotective. So I think they were like, oh, if you go to Joey's house, you know, the parents aren't going to be home and you're going to drink beers in the basement. Right. So well, you can do it at our house and we'll just oh, oversee the whole situation. Exactly. I know that Joey guy. I know what's going <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, he's bad news. Yeah, <laughs> he's bad news. But he could really play the drums. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that's really cool. So how far, how old are you when you first get this guitar? The purple Ibanez? 15, yeah. Wow. What what kind of Ibanez are we talking? Like a 
Um, it was just like a very intro S series, okay. whatever, yeah. you know, I still did it, have it. Did it have a, a whammy bar on it? it yep. Yep. Oh, Not okay. a Floyd, but it did have a whammy. And um, no, I was like the little girl that like went to all like the signings at the music store and was like, Steve, I, can you sign this? And no you know, way. Wild. yeah, I was like, <laughs> really, yeah, into it all. And I still have that guitar with all those signatures on it. Oh, you have to have that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. I mean, the fact that you end up like, you know, being in the biz yourself i mean that's so exciting at least having that sort of access to those kind of people how far are you from the city like how far were you uh from boston About 20 minutes okay so you can go into the city to the big guitar center or whatever and you know that yeah. kind of yeah that's yeah great. yeah and then yeah all through college i ended up you know and i wanted to go to berkeley school of music in boston you know oh sure yeah and my parents were just like we get that you want to do the band thing but there's no way you're going to school for like rock guitar that makes no sense you know right. my dad was like jimmy hendrix didn't go to berkeley santana didn't go to berkeley i don't think anybody in the rolling stones went to berkeley so you'll figure that part out but if you're going to go to school you're going to like learn some school stuff so um but i ended up working at a music store right across the street from berkeley all through I, I attended Northeastern for business, but um, I worked at the music school. So I became friends with all the Berkeley kids. So I was like, show me your notes from this class. And so wow. I kind of got schooled that way. But yeah, that, so, but that helped a lot in my playing, knowing those kids and just kind of jamming with the, in, on what they learned at Berkeley. Did you retain reading? Like, did you learn to read from flute and all that? Um, yeah, but you know what, when it's stacked in chords and stuff, it's just oh, yeah. too much. I mean, I'm a tab reader. I, I mean, I can read charts and stuff, but I don't really solos. I can do it way faster by ear than I could by looking at notes. You know, it's like, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> so that's what you trained was your ear once you kind of got into it. I mean, yeah, because, um, I feel like when I first started, I didn't really know about a lot of tabs or maybe like tab sites weren't that popular at the time because I just, I just remember just, and I didn't even slow down the records, you know, we didn't really no. know that. So I just, yeah, remember just going back over it, over it. I mean, a thousand times over a solo, just hitting rewind and yeah, um, learning that way. That's what we did too. Honestly, I don't even, like I was so, it, it felt like pre-tabs when I was a kid to the point that well i never even really got into that mode of like i own an eddie van halen guitar but I, i'm it just yeah, I it's, it's there for looks i'm not <laughs> qualified to drive that you're welcome to take a stab at it so <laughs> the um you know the ability to um you know when it got into tabs and it got into all that kind of stuff it became a lot more uh for advanced players and i was always kind of like i'm just going to go up here and johnny thunders my way through it because that's kind of where i came from but you clearly who are your guys like who are the people that you look to and thought like that's the person that i want to play like eddie van Halen clearly was yeah um, eddie when i first started and um you know kirk hammett mm -hmm. and zach wild and um you know all, all of ozzy's guitar players randy right. and jakey lee and um you know marty friedman um yeah you know megadeth stuff um oh dime bag huge right fan. right 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 yeah so uh -huh. So when you get into that world, how quickly are you putting a band together? Like how quickly are you okay, I, with people? So, so you know what? I pretty quickly, oh, yeah. uh, I found some kids to jam with. I made my younger sister play drums and she was actually <laughs> really good. And oh, wow. then we had, we didn't have like arts or music programs in our high school, but we started this, um, once a month, we convinced them to leave the cafeteria open after school and oh, we cool. had a coffee house night and so we would jam covers so uh that was like my first concert and that was probably like a year into playing no way um, does, so your, then, does your sister still play you know what she she has she's a chiropractor now but she had an electronic kit in her office you know and she cool. she can still rock out she's still really good but she doesn't really pursue it yeah that's so awesome and then yeah and then i started my own all girl band because i i love the all female thing sure and um and then and then i couldn't find a female bass player oh so then i was like to my younger sister i was like i know you play drums and you're gonna hate me but you have to play bass now like <laughs> and so she hated it but she learned bass not really i mean she learned how to play like the songs in our set and that was right. it <laughs> right but it worked <laughs> that's awesome that's funny yeah. that you say that because it always seemed like and this seems like a, a weird thing to gravitate to but it seemed like all the girls that i knew a lot of them played bass a lot of it was that Smashing Pumpkins, you know, Darcy around that 90s era. Suddenly all my friends' bands had like a pretty girl that could hang on the bass. And I'd be like, damn, it, she's great, you know. Uh, but it's funny yeah. you couldn't find one. 
Yeah, that was a, the cool thing. Yeah, the hot female bass player. Yeah, yeah that, it was seen to be a very normal thing. In in fact, it's common today still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Because who can like throw down and ends up in Prince's band and can kill. Yeah, you're like, it's imposing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Is it weird? Like, I mean, I always find it an interesting topic because I've had very different uh, responses to talking about being a female playing in what essentially is a silly conversation to have playing music seems like um but is it is it has it been weird in any way like if you found i know that you've kind of you know grouped together with a lot of female players so that kind of you know gets rid of a lot of that weirdness but is there ever like that kind of thing when like when you read the old runaway stories about like guys on the side of the stage going like these this will be funny these girls can't play and then they get their ass kicked by the runaways you know yeah that, have you ever experienced that definitely definitely really? Yeah. Oh, always, yeah, yeah. I'm always shocked by that because I'm like, who are these guys? I know it, it. It's so prominent still. I don't know why that is, but it just is. They just, I don't know, some like ego thing. Some people are like that, but I'm sure there's a fair amount of women that judge other women too, and they're like, oh, they they probably can't play, but you just don't notice them as much, or they're less vocal about it. So it might be just across the board. It's just you no. Know it might be a musician thing, to be honest. Let's be, I mean, like take a step back and say like musicians have a, not all musicians, but there have been a tendency to kind of like sit there and, you know, that, that old joke of like, you know, there's always a guitar player that thinks he can play better than that guitar player. You know, as, if online, I'm sure there's people commenting all day long about I'm better than that guy and I'm better than that guy. And you're like, dude, you're in your basement. Like, you know, you, that guy's doing it. You know what I mean? Let's, it's just the nature of, maybe it's just a human thing really beyond male, female gender thing. Just the fact that- True. You know. other musicians watching well that's like the joke like nobody likes to play la because like, everybody's just standing in the audience like this like like impress me yeah. but um yeah i think or maybe it's just really not it, we find it judgmental because it looks judgmental when you're on the stage and you're looking out and everybody's just staring at you like unenthusiastically but right, right. maybe it is just like them concentrating and like really being like okay so like let's yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, Stro think of the stroking their beards like, yeah, okay, like okay. Okay. I see what they're doing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, which is kind of true in a lot of, I mean, a lot of New York, LA, any of those cities that you, you kind of tend to have a large musician uh, percentage come into this, into the room and sort of study what you're doing. And it sort of feels judgmental, but not necessarily. I, I but I think it's an interesting diving into this with you, I feel like I've come out the other side of this going, maybe it's not a gender thing as much as it's just a kind of a musician and a human thing to just, no matter what you're doing, you're going to have people who sort of question it and judge you for it. And it's sort of a gauntlet that you have to go through to kind of come out the other side and go and prove it. Cause you, when someone like you comes up and plays guitar and they go, Oh, okay. You know, it's like, I, I think that you stand toe to toe with anybody, let alone male or female. I think that you're, you're an amazing guitar player. So I think it's kind of nice for you to be the person that goes up there and opens their eyes to that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, and I guess it's probably just like any, any kind of, you know, like I like to go fishing and people are like, like, you know, they think that's a guy thing or, you know, she no, it, or, it, or, you know, there's all sorts of things that it's like, it's not, but it's interesting that still today with musicians, it's, it's still there, but yeah, it's, it's funny. It, yeah. I mean, it, but it is, like I said, it's, it's one of the things that might make you, it might make you better or make you just check out. You know what I mean? It's the kind of thing where you're like- True. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to have thick skin and you have to, yeah, you have to be able to take criticism and stuff like that. But I think it definitely helped me. I mean, I remember there was like this guitar club at, after school in high school and and like the, the guys did not want me in there. Like I was the only girl kind of just like hanging out and they were just like, what are you doing here? Like leave, like you can't play this stuff. So that was great for me because I got really? a guitar and I just locked myself in my room for, you know, hours and hours a day, never came out, never, you know, my parents would be like, you have to eat dinner, come on. But like, <laughs> I just didn't want to put it down. And I was just like, I'm going to play these Metallica songs better than them. And so so that was great. Like, I don't think I would have been so dedicated if I didn't have that challenge of like, you can't, you know, it's like when you're a kid, if somebody says you can't do something, like you will definitely find a way to do it. I think that I'll show them kind of thing goes yeah. a long ways. You know what I mean? Whether it's whoever it is, somebody that, you know, whether it's a family member or friends or, or whatever that to show and prove to them that you can do this. Um, Eventually, you do prove that you can do it, and then you have to find other motivations. But you know, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think that's awesome because there is something to be said. I'd love to I'd love to know some of those guys who were like 
we don't want Brit at this guitar club, man. Cause those, a lot of those guys now have regular jobs and are just normal people. And you're actually like in the biz. So it says a lot about that dedication and, and it's all about dedication, isn't it? Just sort of like that. It, it isn't just about like having a natural ability to play guitar. It's so much about ambition and, and just sort of a whole bigger picture to it. It really is keeping your mindset right and keeping your goals in check. And yeah, I mean, just, it's, there's so many roadblocks. I mean, everybody, it's not like any other job where, yeah, you get a degree and you can go out and now I'll apply and one of these 10 places is going to hire me. Nope. Yeah. It's like you have to be knocked down a lot of times and be still willing to get up. Yeah. It's like I've always said, it's like, um, you know, if, if I actually added up the amount of time that I've done this job from like the mail room to the president's office, I would be the president of the company by now. But that's not the way music works or not the way showbiz works. Because there are peaks and valleys. Sometimes the valleys can go longer than you want, and the peaks don't go nearly as long as you want. But just, but to be still be doing it and be doing it as as your career is is the is the goal. Yeah, well, and it is a labor of love because if you don't love it, I mean, there's no reason to go through everything we have to go through. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? So, what is the process for you when you put the bands together? You start you you start playing beyond like after school cafeteria stuff is it when does it move into i don't know clubs and and whatever else that world takes you to yeah so then i put together this band called jaded uh with the with the drummer who already had been playing out um uh, with some other girls and we kind of reformed the band and and then we had a manager and we were just playing oh. out in bars and clubs you know and i think this is about i'm 17 now um and it's like a real Boston band and we're playing out like four nights a week um and my sister so you know we're in the clubs with the X's on our hands and my parents are driving us to every gig and my dad becomes the roadie and he's carrying all the amps and loading in the drums and my mom ends I up love it. shirts and being the merch lady and um and we did a, we were very busy we did a lot um we went overseas too my yeah, mom I read that and it was, so it was now fun. these are, are these your own songs at this point like you're yeah, you're, yeah, yeah okay so yeah so how does that come about? How does it overseas? Who are you supporting overseas? I can't remember who that was. Oh, that. Wasp. Wasp, that's right. Wow. I, I just, wow, what a baptism in fire that is. Yeah, that's so really crazy. Fun. It was so fun, yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah, and um, yeah, you know what? It was just, you know, when you don't know any better, so you just, you know, they say the more you know, the more like insecure you are, because you just, you know, I didn't know anything. So I was like, we're writing these songs and let's go. And they're awesome. And I didn't think twice about it. Didn't care what anybody no. thought. So it all just fell into place and it all worked, you know, um, and and people liked us and we were a good band. Um, we, yeah, we had a lot of shows and um, it was a blast. And then that just kind of wound down because we always had problems with our lead singer. It was always the jealous boyfriend or this or that. And it was just like reached a point. And I was like, we can't replace this singer again. This is so oh, stupid. No. And, um, and that's when I was like, you know, what? I'm going to start looking for like bands where I just show up and play guitar and I can just, you know, that's a thing. I didn't realize I could just do that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, it's interesting that you bring that up because people don't really understand how difficult it is to keep a band together. Like we all wish, I don't know. I'm sure you're similar to me. It was where I'm like 20 years old. I put together Aerosmith and then I'm 80 years old and I'm still in Aerosmith. You know what I mean? Like that's, right. that's, that's the best thing in the entire world. It hasn't worked out that way for me. I don't think it works out that way for a lot of people, frankly, it just sort of like, but when you finally get to that point where you're like, well, I have this guitar and I can play this damn thing and I can play for anybody. Um, is that when you decide maybe Los Angeles is a destination? No, um, I didn't decide Los Angeles until, um, no, so, so I, so I decided that I wanted to start playing for other people. I went to an audition, didn't get it, was like, oh, I obviously am not meant to play guitar and was like so discouraged because oh, really? like one first audition I didn't get. So I'm thinking like, well, it's time to, it's time to hang it up, you know, <laughs> but no, that was a stupid idea. And so, um, but from that audition, I got called for another gig and that turned into a big, awesome, like three-year tour. And when that ended, I came back to Boston and that was in like South America. I spent a lot of time in like yeah. beautiful, beautiful climates, you know? Who was that I, artist? Alejandro Sanz. Yeah, I see this is another good example that you bring up because a lot of people treat these auditions, whether it's actors or whatever, they treat auditions as do or die. Like I didn't get that gig, so I'm gonna go back and, you know, go to school. 
But what you brought up is, is one of the perfect examples of you may not get that gig, but somebody saw you and said, and I'm saying this to my actor friends as well as, as yeah. anybody else. It's kind of like people see you and they go, well, this person's not right for this thing that we're doing, but they're great. And they get and you get bookmarked for another thing. And the next thing you know, you've got a gig like that that goes on for however long. I mean, you get to go and see South America. A lot of people never go to South America. It's one of the greatest places in the world to go. It Argent is. Argentina, Colombia, uh, Brazil. I mean, all that kind of stuff is Venezuela. It's like some of the greatest places, greatest audiences in the world too. Was this artist, um, were they based out of there or were they based out of California? Or, um, or I mean, out of America? Half, half out of Madrid and half out of Miami. Oh, interesting. Wow. Okay. So, so was it, was it a big Spanish speaking uh, hang? Uh, yeah, actually half the band didn't even speak English. Oh, is that and right? Wow. I learned, I learned Spanish very quickly on the fly. Wow. I, cool. Yeah. And they were looking for a rock guitar player kind of thing. Is that the idea? They were, they were. Yeah. 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 And it was, yeah, it was, it was just so great. But then, then, yeah, I got accustomed to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all that beautiful weather. And then I came home to Boston in the middle of a snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, what am I doing here? Why do I live here? This is, this is no quality of life. And, uh, <laughs> and so then I was like, okay, LA it is. That has, That's me too. I grew up in Canada. So it's a very similar type thing. Although, I didn't go to South America in the middle of that. I, I just kind of started slowly moving my way west and then south was the idea. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, so then, and did you find Los Angeles? What, what year did you go to Los Angeles, to LA? Uh, so 2015, six years ago in October. Okay, so that's that's interesting to bring up because it's like when you talk about LA and you talk about like your, you know, some friends of yours that moved out there in 86 because, you know, there was a thing happening. It was a scene and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's always an interesting thing because no matter what's going on, Los Angeles is still the center of the universe when it comes to the music industry in a big, in a lot of ways, you know what I mean? So when you want to go and play music, you kind of have to go to where that is a thing. And, and those auditions are happening and all that kind of stuff that's happening there, especially if you're just going as yourself with a guitar um, and you can have that kind of thing already. When you got, was there something that brought you there or were you just kind of going there like to see what happens? You know what? No, I just, nothing brought me there. I, di I didn't have a gig and I was just, just looking for something new. And I felt like, oh, when I came home, I felt like all my friends were kind of like getting married and having kids and buying houses. Nobody was jamming and I didn't really right. see change. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know where I fit in here anymore. See, they grew up, Rit. They grew up. They left. Us. I know. I know. <laughs> My mom was always like singing me the Peter Pan song. She's like, she's like, you're like Peter Pan. You never, you never want to grow up. And I'm like, no, I really don't. So I'm moving <laughs> to the place where all adults don't want to grow up. LA. Never. It's perfect. Never. The only place worse than that is Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my but, god yeah. but that's kind of great so then are you like networking as they say are you trying to like make did you know people enough to kind of start that process well, or did you, you have know, to kind of so you know what was actually funny is i i was all packed up i had everything ready to go i was going to drive across country and then two days before i was going to leave i actually got called for a gig for with a pop artist and so i had kind of like a six month or yeah yeah around their stint and but they were all radio tv promo stuff so it was all new york la new york la so i wow. actually ironically just got to spend a lot of weekends in la before i even moved out there so i ended up meeting people that way which was really cool um and then when that ended then i then i moved out but but i didn't have a gig and um and it was just kind of funny you know the way things happen it's like um you know, I, I walked into the rainbow and, you know, saw, saw somebody we recognized from my space and they were like, what are you doing? Do you have a gig? And I said, no, I like, I literally just got here and they were like, we need a guitar player. And cool. so like, you know, then that kind of just happened and things just kind of happened. You know, it's only when you're not desperate. And that's what I realized. I, I feel like I came out to LA not dying for a gig because I had just done some gigs. So I was like, not feeling like I was missing something in my life. Like, oh, I'm never going to be happy unless I get the huge gig once I moved to LA. You know, I didn't have that. And I think, I think when you're not so hungry is when things happen because sometimes that can, I don't know how it messes with the energy, but it does. Because when I've wanted something so bad, I couldn't be further from it. When I finally let it go, it comes to you. I don't that's, know how that works. That's but. super true. I mean, they say the same thing about relationships and all kinds of things. It's when you're right. just hyper focused on something that it just seems to get further and further away. It's kind of like when you let it go, it just sort of starts to materialize. So 
that's really interesting that you said. Luckily, you're in the place, you know, maybe the fact that you kind of went out there and you happen to be in a place where it's plentiful, you know, these kind of things are around, you know, you kind of, you go, yeah, okay, I'll do that for a while. Yeah, I'll do that for a while. What, what, what was this gig that popped up at the Rainbow? Um, it was an, another all-female um, Guns N' Roses tribute. Oh, the Paradise Kitty gig, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. With Rachel in the game. So, yeah. yeah, so Rachel and I were friends yeah. on MySpace for forever, and we, we talked about doing a band like a long time ago before I could have possibly made it to LA because I was so young at the time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But it was so crazy. And I like see her up there and she's like, I know you from somewhere. And I was like, yeah, you look familiar too. And we we're like, I don't know. And then she came back, she was like, my space. And I was like, oh, so, and that was cool. And that was really fun. Of course, I love Guns N' Roses. Um, and, you know, picking apart, learning all the slash parts was so much fun. Yeah, and, I got and then I had never actually played like the, the cool strip clubs. Like, I mean, not strip clubs, but like clubs on the sunset, sunset strip clubs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a big designation there to make yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like the whiskey and the viper. So we started doing that. So that was really fun for me already. Totally. I'm like, yay, this is so LA. This is great. And, um, but I did try to grow up. I mean, I did get here and realize, okay, men LA this is like the real deal things are way more expensive here gas is yeah. like five dollars a gallon like I have to I kind of have to have my shit together yeah. so um I was like well maybe I'm supposed to just like use my degree and grow up so I actually did get a job working at Universal Records oh okay wow and when I first moved here and was like okay let's just I'm gonna do this I'm gonna like be an adult and be in the music business and um and I was in the legal department and uh wow I I didn't know this. I didn't know this about you. Wow. Yeah. Changed my entire perception of you. You're so much more than a guitar player. Yes, that's I'm, my I'm so much less than a guitar player. <laughs> my Clark Kent side. I wear glasses yeah. too. Understood. Understood. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but I have to be honest, like I, it was fun. I like, you know, contracts are interesting. I, I enjoyed mm. reading all the deals and working on it. All that was really great, but just being at a desk and being told you have to be here from nine to six and then traffic. Wow. And, and I was like, by the time I got home, I was like one of those people that was wiped out. You know, I felt like the people in the movies that worked yeah. the, around the clock and you, you watch the clock and it's like every hour is just like eternity. And I was like, oh my God. And I would call my mom. My mom's the greatest. I would call her on the way home and just bitch, bitch, bitch. <laughs> like about my day. And I never had anything good to say. And I was so negative. And I'm not a negative person. I'm pretty generally enthusiastic about life. Yeah. And um, she was like, Britt, this does not even sound like you anymore. I'm so sick of you calling. I love that you call me. But to be honest, I don't want to hear from you until it's when you call me to tell me that you quit. <laughs> okay, don't good. call me till then <laughs> and I was and she was so right uh but it, yeah it just wasn't for me and I you know I'd get home and I wouldn't be playing music I'd be just too wiped out from sitting and doing nothing and I was like this is just not healthy for me it's just not not me so yeah that's the worst part is, is in reality you kind of have the idea that I'll do this to supplement what I want to do but you're not doing what you want to do so therefore what am I doing you know like what is the purpose of this yeah yeah and it's hard for me to if I would do we're, something- We're, we're convincing people to quit their jobs right now, you realize. You should go into that pottery thing you want to do or him. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> oh it's good God. to have a plan. It's good to have a plan. But yeah, yeah. Like, like, like you say, it's one of those things where, you know, and how long did it take for you to, as you started to let go of that, that was sort of holding you back, how long did it take between that and- I don't know, Vixen or whatever it was that sort of made you feel like, okay, yeah, I, I think I'm all right. I can do this, do this now. Yeah, not not long, you know, because because then I started just, you know, playing more and, and getting involved in the jam scene out here, which I like sure. a cool jam scene. And so- um, Are you talking like Lucky Strike and the Whiskey yeah, and one and all right. that stuff? Yeah, playing out there. And, and then that's kind of how I fell into the Vixen thing. The man yeah. saw me play at one of those nights and, you know, so it just right. all happened to work out. Well, it's kind of a no brainer, really, like when I, you know, when I thought about it afterwards, because, um, you know, something like like Vixen, because the funny thing about Vixen is it's like, in a lot of ways, you know, you would have been very young when that when they were having their heyday. So were you familiar with the group? Did you know about the band? Did you know the songs? I did because I um, was because the they, weird they were kid. all girls and that whole thing kind of. Well, you know what? Because I was into Van Halen, then I got oh, really right. into Motley Crue and Poison, and just like, and I just became obsessed with the '80s scene. And I grew course, up in yeah. the grunge era, and 
as a person learning guitar, I wasn't inspired by that music. Like it right. didn't, didn't excite me to want to, I never was like, I need to learn that Nirvana song that never right. crossed my right. mind at the time. And so I was like, it was all about like, yeah, doing like jump, jump kicks and being Eddie and, you know, and having fun and, and a shiny uh, guitar. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so through my eighties research and of all the hair bands and stuff. And I, and then I loved Vixen. I mean, that was yeah. the only all girl. So I was super inspired by them. It's funny that we talk about that. Like I'm saying how weird it is that we're talking about like all girl bands being an anomaly, but in reality, Vixen was the anomaly in that scene. They were, I mean, obviously Lorraine doing femme fatale, Right, and Lita, but, but and Lita, but they weren't the only girls in that group. Lita, of course, comes from right the runaways, but but in reality, that you're you're absolutely correct that that those girls were um, the only one of. I mean, there obviously were other bands probably, but the one that really broke through and became like a platinum selling act for sure. Yeah, I just thought they were just so cool. It's like because you know the whole. I mean, girls like guys in vans because they're like a gang and they're just cool and then they hang out together. And I just thought like, wow, the all girl version of that is so awesome. Like if you could the- only really see what that gang is like, gang of guys sitting around like, bitching <laughs> about each other behind their backs. What's his deal, man? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you know uh, that better than anybody now. Come on. I know. I know. <laughs> And I love those memes that are out now too, where it's like, you know, what people think we're like, yeah. and that we're really <laughs> yeah. like, and everybody's just, you know, you know, slicing avocados backstage, and you know, you know, no. it's a, it's embarrassing to admit this, but I'm going to admit it for you and for all my friends is that I played on Fremont Street. It was like Woodstock, you know, '69. It was like a million people, yeah. and because my car was parked so like perfectly, like right b- behind the stage, and they were so kind of like okay, we want to get these cars out of here as quickly as possible because we have to, da, da, da. and I'm like, okay. So I literally walked off stage and I was in my own bed like 50, <laughs> 50 minutes after I walked off stage. <laughs> I just thought, like, And I thought there's like after parties happening and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, but I was in my home t- where I live. So I literally got in my car. They wanted me to get the car out of here. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to go park in the parking garage now. I just said, like, ah, the hell, I'll just go home. And I'm like, feed my cats. I'm like, wow, big rock star. <laughs> big boring roll my garbage out onto the front street you know and and i'm just like wow if they could only you know the people at that show are thinking he's out partying you know getting in in trouble and like no i'm not honestly but i'm i'm the 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 biggest cliche when it comes to those memes what they think is happening what is actually happening i love that one time we were sitting backstage with slash and the guys and i remember just sitting there and we were like you know not paying much attention to anything except there was this bigfoot documentary going on on tv and i just thought Man, if somebody came back here right now, they'd be so disappointed. You know, so there's <laughs> yeah. a bunch of guys exhausted from like, you know, traveling and just kind of sitting there watching. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that, that makes a lot, you know. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if anybody came back here, they'd be like, what happened back? Is there some sort of carbon monoxide leak in here? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I digress. Oh, it's so true though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, when you travel as much as we do, I mean, it's like, you can only do so much. But yeah. um. No, I mean, with you guys, uh, when you see like uh, Vixen, uh, at the band had massive hits. Richard Marx wrote that one song was gigantic. Like, um, and I was only vaguely aware, I mean, as well, as you know, cause you, this, you brought up an interesting thing about ki- people that grew up in the grunge era. Mm. I know so many people who grew up, you know, in that era who were excited about guitar cause they'd heard those songs from the previous incarnation of, of rock and roll and went like, I want to play like that. And they had to go in reverse. And I know so many guys of that same era who kind of came up and go, well, I, I, I fell in love with the offspring or something like that. But then I found, you know, George Lynch or whatever the hell they found. Right. Sort of opens up another door. So you're one of those people. And I think that, you know, that drags you back to finding Vixen and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that was, that was lucky because yeah, I was, I started learning like all the technical stuff instead of just, you know, power chords and things and so that was so yeah i i went through the whole thing and all i learned was power chords so <laughs> i have no excuse <laughs> i have no excuse to be, some people want to be eddie van halen and some people want to be paul stanley and i i, I just stayed in that in that generation but yeah. the um so when you uh when this starts to present itself because for those that don't know i mean vixen kind of went through some a couple of different incarnations along the way and um when you came in who was who was the lineup at that point Roxy, Roxy, Cher, Cher, Janet, and uh, Janet was still there. 
Yep. Right? And Gina Stiles was playing guitar. Yeah. Okay. For for those who, who are following along, that's three quarters of the original lineup. Then, yeah. Correct. Right. So you right. you joined and, and, you you joined, and you were the the you joined three quarters of the original lineup. Yes. Yes. Because you were, you replaced Gina then. That's right. Yep. Yeah. She had directly replaced um, Jan when she passed. Yeah. And, when she yeah. passed. Yeah. Which is a sad story, but. Um, I was so happy to hear that they got it back together because I know there was a lot of like weirdness that went on. You know, it's so funny. And any band that's been around long enough, there's always some chapter of weirdness. And these people aren't talking to those people and there's lawyers and you're like, what the hell happened here? Can't we, even to this day, I mean, I don't want to get into naming names, but we know all kinds of people. You know, all kinds of people where we're like, well, can't you guys just kind of like, you know, put it together somehow? I mean, I understand because as we mentioned before, keeping a band together, you already went through this with Sacred and or with Jaded, I'm sorry, and, and a bunch of other, you know, incarnations, it's not easy. So it wouldn't be any easier for Vixen or anybody else. Right, right. Especially yeah. when you become successful, that makes it even harder. You know? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. yeah. It becomes about like, how come you're driving that car and I can only get this car or, you know, it's like, they're both sports cars. <laughs> we're, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you add into it the, the very thing we were just talking about, the shift in the music scene that altered everything, you know, when, when, uh, when the, grunge came in and alternative music came in it's sort of the 80s music sort of uh people who had massive careers were suddenly faced with um a big shift and big change yeah i know like yeah finding your new style do you change mm -hmm. times you stay true to what you do and yeah do you go yeah. work for universal records <laughs> no don't do it <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but that's awesome though that i mean and it's interesting when you when you look at those sort of like you know, the way the world just kind of keeps moving and weaving. And the next thing you know, you're like standing in a room with those girls with a guitar on going like, damn, I'm in the room with those girls from that that music video I watched. You know, <laughs> I know, I know. There's been so many moments in my life where I'm like, is this real? Like a 15 year old me is just like speechless. <laughs> like, I wow. Know. I would never have guessed in my wildest. You can never, you, you should never really lose that perspective. And I, I say that all the time, because it's like, there's all kinds of moments that happen where you go like, where even sometimes you're like, oh man, I'm tired and I don't want to get on this plane or whatever. And you go, wait a second, your 15 year old self would be like, what? You get to go to Poughkeepsie this weekend and play rock and roll? You know, you're like, yeah, you're right. I, I do get to do that. That is pretty awesome. And I, and I suppose maybe having the wake up call of having to work in an office and having a desk job might keep you maybe, maybe it's a healthy thing that you did that so you know like in between all this that it kind of wakes you up to the fact that well it's never too late to work nine to five as yeah. Stanley said <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's true I actually like when I'm home doing something else because I feel like it keeps me balanced and excited for you know what you sure. don't yeah, you're just like, okay, I just was like working on this. And like, so I do the rock and roll fantasy camp stuff now yeah. too. So, and, and, but that's lucky. I mean, one good thing that came from COVID is I love working from home and like, yeah. you know, not going into that office, but, you know, but doing that and then, that, and that's really fun on its own too. And then, but then it's like, oh, it's so exciting when I get to leave and do the rock star thing. So totally. Yeah. No, yeah, the rock and roll fantasy camp quickly i know you guys are putting together an all-female version of that too right like a, yeah. like a like a chapter of it or whatever so who's all involved in that yeah we've never done that before and i was like that would be so cool just because you know i don't know we did we didn't um we did master classes online right. we right. Zoom during covid and and we didn't all all girls one with with lita and it oh, was okay. sold out really fast and it was just so fun and i thought it was really special because you know we're all girls that are musicians and we just think you have different experiences than guys do you just do because it's i don't know and so Lita, it leaders especially because that was like we're talking the 70s you know into the 80s yeah know. her stories are mm -hmm. you know crazy stuff so but it was really cool to have like this open kind of forum where you could just kind of say anything and nobody's going to judge you or whatever and so so yeah that's the hope for the the women's camp that it's just going to be you know everybody sharing their stories and experiences and and what they've learned and just be really open and honest in a really cool setting so yeah we've got melissa etheridge um, oh wow kathy valentine go go oh, i love kathy i was yeah. jam with kathy back in the day yeah she's amazing Oh uh, yeah, she's so cool. Yeah, yeah we did some master, a master class with her too. She was really fun. Um, Orianthi. Sure. Um, and um, uh, oh, and Nancy Wilson. How could I forget? Oh wow, really? my favorites. Yeah. yeah. And then, so those are like the guest stars, and then we've got um, awesome counselors. We've got Rhonda Smith. Um, yeah. 
you know, friends. Um, yeah. We've I got um, Eva Gardner. Rhonda's, Rhonda's Canadian. She's oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's originally from like Montreal or something like that. I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've talked before, yeah. Um, and who was after Rhonda? It, what? Who was that? What, what's that? The one you just said? Something, oh, Gardner? Eva Gardner, do you know her? Bass Eva player? Gardner. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. What was she from again? She, Pink, uh, Gwen Stefani. Right. She's, yeah. She's done a lot. She's, Great. Yeah, she's really cool. Um, you know, we, we just have awesome counselors. Gretchen, Gretchen Mann, who plays in Zeparella. Right. She, she's awesome guitar player um roxy from vixen is gonna do it sure yeah so it's gonna be just really fun so yeah roxy's a legend too man I, i'll you know madam x and all that i was there you know i was like i was on board i talked yeah. to sebastian about i've talked to sebastian about madam x many times you know it's like oh yeah it was i mean that was he was what 17 or something like that when he started doing that sebastian bach i think so yeah so I have to clarify which sebastian we're talking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's an interesting thing that you you know by today's standards looking at Orianthi, Nita Strauss, mm -hmm. and yourself. Like I, 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 you know, it's like I, I take a step back and go, yeah, there's some heavy hitter, like tiny little blonde girls that are throwing down out there. You're like, damn, you know, it's like, I've watched Nita's career completely blow up, you know, from the, um, just by being attached to Alice and which in turn was replacing Orianthi. Right. So there you go. It's yeah. uh, cause or, you know, Orianthi was with Michael Jackson, and then, Al then Alice and then Nita replaced her. So. It is one of those things that's really cool to see a, a lot of female guitar players getting that kind of recognition. And I think you, I think you're right in there, sister. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, uh, so what's going on? I, I've been reading a lot about a, a promised Vixen record that is just kind of like still stuck in the, I would imagine like everybody's stuck in, it got stuck. And then it really got stuck when COVID came along. It's like, yeah, it wasn't stuck before COVID. We were doing a lot of writing sessions. It was going right. great. And then, yeah, we live, you know, Florida, Detroit, LA. We're very, Nashville, we're very spread out. So it's not easy. Are, to are all four of you in different cities? It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's become the new thing. Well, our singer was in LA, but then she moved to upstate Washington during. Right. The, yeah, so when, when did Lorraine get in, in, in involved in the band? That was 2019? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, but you so know, Lorraine. It, Lorraine was the lead singer in Femme Fatale, who were another '80s great band, and uh, she replaced Janet, I guess. Huh? Yeah, but yeah. you know, what was cool is Lorraine has worked um, in different side projects with both Roxy and Cher. That's and right. I, I read that. Always kind of involved, and our Janet um, had a, a health issue that came up, and Lorraine filled in for a gig for us before. Oh, you know, wow. So it's kind of like a weird foreshadowing thing. So she did a full set with us, you know, so she really knew the songs by the time, you know, she actually stepped in. So it was, it was kind of cool. That's how that so worked. cool. I mean, that's often the way those things kind of shake down is it's, it's usually like, kind of like, well, what about them? <laughs> the yeah. person that's like, you know, basically attached to us already. It's like, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, I saw you guys I don't know where we were. Where were we? Big Flats, um, New York. I think yes. we were in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I was like knocked out because, I mean, it, it's. I mean, you guys sound amazing. Plus, you got Tyson playing keyboards. Our Tyson's dear friend awesome. Tyson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it sounded amazing, and and getting to see you throw down on the crazy Randy Rhodes with smashed mirror like finish, <laughs> I was just like, wow, we were taking it up a notch today. <laughs> it was great. I thought it was great. Oh, thanks. So now what's happened with the record? Like, is so, it? Okay. Yeah, the record's going slowly, but we are making some progress. We've got a lot of demos um, that are just, you know, when you're like in the moment in the writing session and then like a year goes by with COVID and then you re-listen and you're like, are we there still? No, I don't think so. We don't like them right. now. So if we had kept going, those songs would have been recorded and we would have liked them. But mm -hmm. now that this time has passed, everybody hates them all. You know, <laughs> it's like no we can do better so now we're kind of starting back from the drawing board starting from scratch and um it's it's going good it's just um you know well now now i want to hear those old demos <laughs> I like the old i'm still a fan of the old stuff we got to yeah. do something with them so yeah <laughs> they're cool that's but that's always a, a frustrating thing that happens because that does happen with music when it sort of sits on the vine for too long and those grapes start to get kind of like um 
maybe we should plant some new grapes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, stale, even though nobody's heard them and you've never, you know, but so they're not stale, but yeah, you're just kind of in a different headspace. And so, and then the girls don't love to do like file sharing and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, they're, you know, it's, they're, they're cool. Like they're just like, we want to get in a room and hash it out and everybody write together at the same time, all our parts and, and, and give feedback real time and like, just get it done. So that's what they like to do. And I, I think that's awesome. Cause I, that is an interesting thing you bring up because in the days of COVID, I'm sure you're in the same boat as me, where it's like, I'm in this room all the time doing stuff with projects with people I've never physically met, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and you're just like working on stuff and, and, but you know, guys like Slash and guys like Cher and Roxy who are from back in the day, that's not going to be a thing. Like we need to be in a room together. And I still feel that way. Like it's, it's always like, even, even like recently I've been having this conversation recording on a, on a project and I'm kind of like, you do this whole thing, you send it off. Then that person sits on it for a minute. Then they send in their ideas of what we should do. And I go, this could all be handled. Like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Great. If we're in the same room together, it just gets handled in the moment. But, yeah. but I mean, you're from a generation now where this has become, you know, kind of normal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. But, but you know what, but I, I respect that. I like, I like their, I'm cool with it. It's just now a matter of like logistically, okay, where are we going to meet up and when are we going to do this? And it's just, so it's a little more. When that happens, where does it happen? I mean, do you guys normally have like, I know once, once you get an existing, uh, an act that's going out and playing, people don't really think about the fact that people can fly in from four different places to big flats, New York and play a show and then fly back home. But when you actually rehearse, is it Nashville or something like that? Or where do you go? Or LA? It's called sound check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what we do too. It's like a lot of time too, yeah. <laughs> well, at some point you're gonna have to pull the trigger on like we're going to Nashville or we're going to LA yeah. or, and we're exactly. gonna be in the same I think room. it's gonna be LA. I think it's gonna be LA. And uh, hopefully, you know, before the holidays so we can get this done. That would be exciting. Is were the girls based out of LA back in the day? They were. They were. They were. Okay. Yeah. Here, yeah. And then yeah. everybody was like, "Screw LA." <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. 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 It's funny because, uh, well, I mean, I have so many friends out here from LA because, you know, it's it's close enough that everybody goes, "Well, I can drive back to LA," but yeah. it's it's becoming harder and harder to make it make it go. But I still have a, a great deal of affection for Los Angeles, especially when you get to go to the studios and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you. You know what was done in this building? You know, it's a long list of what was done uh, in said building. You know, so much history, I know. Absolutely. So what's coming up? What have you got? Um, what and uh, how much was crushed for you? I'm, I, got, I finally got to meet you after COVID. Well, well it's, I, like, I like talking about after COVID when we're still in the middle of COVID. <laughs> we, we sort of think of it as after COVID, but meeting you like when gigs were coming back. So mm -hmm. that sort of changed that idea of like, um, clearly you guys would have had a record probably in the pipeline that got kind of squashed and a, a year's worth of dates probably just got you know squashed as well so so now that you're back is is the calendar pretty pretty full is it kind of blowing up a bit it is our fall is busy so i'm really excited for that although like we just had a couple dates cancel this week so because of covid so oh yeah I know. We keep most of them that are on the books but um yeah we're heading back out um this weekend the new york state fair back to back to upstate. yeah um we're doing milwaukee summer fest that'll be fun um what else do we have yeah we we've got some fun some fun stuff coming up some casinos some outdoor festivals some theaters so um yeah it's looking good and then somewhere in between there we will get into a studio so yeah that's the plan but we have a full a full lineup we've got um puerto rico so we've got some key cool. west we've got some fun stuff coming up very cool um, fun warm locations yeah that's nice we had a gig in in vegas but um that's oh is that is that the one that fell through where was it supposed to be yeah. um at the cannery i think they're gonna oh, move bummer. all their dates to 2022 though that was gonna be uh -huh. with row so i was looking forward to that but that's yeah ah, so. bummer well one of these days we'll cross paths so yeah. what um and, and is there going to be a physical rock and roll fantasy camp um hang yes, yes. um and when's that they're gonna be in 2022 we actually had okay. them plan for November and December, but we just decided, you know what, let's just be safe. Uh, we don't want to have any, you know, we want it to be a safe, fun environment. Yeah, We're just to worry, you know, there's so much worrying going on. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's and hard to relax in some of those situations. I actually just went to one of my first 
I went to see the Black Crows the other night and it was like oh, my cool. first time like being really At like the in forum? the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but being in like a bunch of people and like being like, okay, am I okay with this? Cause it's like, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like I'm messes up your mind a little bit. I know. I know it is a fascinating thing. Cause you know, just the other night standing with, you know, on stage, you look out and you go, well, this is what it is. You know, at this point, we're kind of like, this is where we're at and we're going to do our best and, and get through this. But um, I mean, it's such a weird, weird thing being in this position where we all have to get back to work. The whole world has to get back to work, but um, musicians and all that kind of stuff, our whole world, our work involves being around a whole lot of other people in really quote unquote unsafe situations. So, you know, I just hope that, you know, everybody can stay as safe as possible. I mean, I just talked to Corey, Corey Taylor's just getting over COVID. <laughs> it just came up, you know, three fifths of that band now that's been through. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, three fifths of that band has been through COVID. So yeah, it's 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 just the way, you know, it's it's unfortunately kind of like, it's going to be a, a, a baptism of fire as well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But hopefully it doesn't happen to you. I know I've been lucky so far. I Good have not you. had it. I've been one of the few people I know that haven't had it yet. So Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Well, I'm, uh, I, I've taken up way too much of your time, but I really appreciate it. We before we went on, we were talking about your guitars behind you. You really have some beautiful guitars back there. Are those, um, until, until the people from Gibson come to claim them back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a, bu there's a bunch here too. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got a nice uh, yeah, black standard. Oh, uh, the uh, black standard. You can't go wrong with the black standard. And I like this one. This one is, it's an 08 and it's got the um, asymmetrical neck that they didn't really, they don't make that much. Like, I can't find another one like that, which is- What do you of, mean asymmetrical? What's asymmetrical um, about it? So when uh, you're holding it like this half, if this is the fretboard, like this half is thinner. Really? It's, oh, it, so it, it's actually like- Yeah, and it just fits so, it feels so cool. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit thinner on the, you know, top three strings around that curve. Um, so it's it's a, such a cool neck. And I, I've asked um, Gibson, I was like, are you going to make any more like that? They're like, no. I was like, but it's the best. It's such a cool neck. So I really love that one. And you can't go wrong with No, that thing is, that's like having a Cadillac parked behind you right there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it's a beautiful Caddy. Caddy. Yeah. I know. It's like, whew. yeah, but yeah. I, I but I, I really like the Jacksons you play too. Those are really cool. Ah, oh, thanks. I love those. That was my first first love. Those yeah, Randy, flying the Randy me. Rose guitars. Yeah, I actually I want to get one someday. Oh, they're awesome. Thanks. Well, I know I know somebody now. Just kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I really really appreciate you hanging out with me, and uh, hopefully we'll get to cross paths sooner than later. Whether you come here or. I don't know, maybe I'll be filling in for somebody and randomly be at wherever you're at. So I knows? hope so. I know. That That'd would be, be so fun. much fun. Yeah. It was so much fun having getting to hang out with you that night and, and getting to watch you guys play and watch um Slaughter. Slaughter. I didn't stick around for Great White, but uh, I'm sure it was wonderful. Yeah, it was I get it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was so fun. Well, this is great talking to you. Thank you, you so too. much for having me. And I let yeah, your guitar is very good. And I know I gotta you've got uh, I'm not qualified for a lot of them. You're welcome to <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep in touch. Great okay, to, great like to see you. You okay. too. Thanks so much, Todd. Bye. Bye-bye. Big love.